Hello. Welcome to Episode 2 of The Infectious Myth. I'm very pleased to have with me today uh, my guest, Dr. Charles Geschechter. Charles, are you with us? Yes, I'm right here, David. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's good to talk to you again. Uh, Dr. Geschechter is Emeritus Professor of African History at California State University, Chico. After earning his Ph.D. in History from UCLA, Geschechter held three Fulbright Awards, and his African field research was supported by grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Ford Foundation, and Social Science Research Council. His publications have examined various aspects of modern Somali history, techniques of documentary filmmaking, and reappraising the AIDS epidemic in Africa. From 2000 to 2003, Charles Geschechter was a member of the South African Presidential AIDS Advisory Panel. And personally, I've also known him as a member of the Board of Rethinking AIDS for much longer than I've been involved. And full disclosure, I'm the president of that organization. And I've also known him as a speaker at the RA 2009 conference. So today, I think we'll talk about Africa and AIDS. Those seem to be two areas that you're very familiar with. You wrote uh, fairly recently, Africa has suffered from numerous real wars over the past 30 years, but a prism called the War on AIDS continues to distort its public health landscape. It's time for a critical look at AIDS in Africa. To explain African AIDS, the traditional narrative alleges that a monkey virus, long submerged in the Central African rainforest, has somehow left to humans by a bushmeat hunters when one of them accidentally cut himself with a knife enabling the butchered chimp's tainted blood to mix with his sometime between the 1890s and the 1930s. So what did you mean by that? Where do you think AIDS comes from in Africa, or is there AIDS in Africa? (laughs) Well, uh, I stand by every word of that that quote. Um, That's based on my reading, actually, of the various theories to explain the origin of HIV, uh, in Africa, <clears throat> and I think it's important at the outset to make a rather careful distinction between HIV and AIDS, and most of my work has really concentrated on the definition of AIDS in Africa, which I was surprised to learn in the late 1980s when I first became interested in this topic, that the actual definition of an AIDS case in, say, Uganda or, or uh, Zaire or Zimbabwe or South Africa is different than an AIDS case, say, here in California or in San Francisco. And that led me to wonder what we were talking about, because in order to make inroads and advances in knowledge and understanding, we have to be clear, as clear as we can, about the terms that we're actually using. And so when I discovered in the late 80s that the definition of an AIDS case in Africa involves a range of very common and very widespread symptoms. And I realized that I had actually suffered from all of those symptoms while working in very harsh and very straitened conditions in the semi-desert areas of the Horn in Somalia and eastern Ethiopia. Right. And yet those symptoms all went away when I, when I came home after a couple of long airplane rides I wondered if maybe the cure for those symptoms was an airplane ride. Yeah, I certainly, I certainly got better. Now, I'm being facetious about that, but when talking about this topic, it's extremely important to avoid the kind of ponderous, somber, fear-making uh, agenda and narrative, which is, in fact, uh, the heart and soul of the AIDS orthodoxy. So my, my first curiosity was arisen by the different definitions of an AIDS case from one continent to the other, I was never aware that there was a clinical condition that would be defined one way on one continent and another way on another continent. That, that seems strange can to I me. Read, can I read the uh, 1986 Bangui definition, or at least a small part of it, to, sure. yes. to uh, give some context here? Yeah. So AIDS in an adult, according to this definition, which, as you point out, is used mainly in Africa and other really poor parts of the world. AIDS in an adult is defined by the existence of at least two of the major signs associated with at least one minor sign. In the absence of known causes of immunosuppression, such as cancer or severe malnutrition or other recognized etiologies, 
Uh, one, major signs are A, weight loss greater than 10% of body weight, B, chronic diarrhea for over a month, C, prolonged fever over a month, either intermittent or constant. And uh, the minor signs are A, persistent cough for over a month, B, generalized puritic dermatitis, which is basically a fancy word for icky rash, uh, C, recurrent herpes zoster, um, D, oropharyngeal candidiasis, uh, and there's a couple of others. So basically, if you have weight loss greater than 10% of your body weight and chronic diarrhea or fever, you have two of the major signs. And then if you have a persistent cough or an itchy rash, you've got the one minor sign that's needed and you have AIDS without the need for an HIV test. Mm-hmm. Well, and, I can only tell you that um, I weighed, weigh 178 pounds and uh, very often subsisting off of uh, uh, camel, smoked camel's milk and some fairly uh, poor diets in, in the Horn of Africa. Mm-hmm. For me to lose that kind of weight over a couple of months was fairly common. I certainly persistently developed and had to wear face masks to protect me from uh, sneezing and coughing. Uh, certainly that would last uh, 8 to 15 days. And diarrhea would come and go. I mean, I took low modal and tried mm-hmm. to contain it that way. And while I may not be statistically exactly what they're saying, I certainly had all of those symptoms and felt weak, uh, felt tired, uh, felt sick, and was sick and was ill. But right. those, those were environmental insults that had nothing whatsoever to do with sexual activities, uh, drug use, um, any of those kinds of things. So I sort of wondered, what did I have? And if you had somebody had diagnosed you with AIDS on the basis of the fact that you had the symptoms that matched it, and if, if you had accepted that, that this was a true diagnosis and you'd known that AIDS was incurable, how do you think that would have affected your mental state if, if you had accepted, okay, I've, I've got all these things and they're not going to go away when I go back to America. I now have a fatal illness and it's just going to get worse. I, if that had happened in, say, 1986 or 1987, early on in the, in the AIDS era, I would have been scared, very, very scared, and yeah. would have wondered, and would have wondered, now, I'm a straight guy, I have a great maudlin fear of needles, <laughs> um, I didn't have any, any sex with any Africans, male or female, how did I get this? I would have started to wonder about it, but I would have been scared. I would have been investigating in a very frightened state. There's no doubt about that, which I think is important to understand that that state of mind among people globally is probably still the same today in 2014. And I think it's been stimulated and those fires stoked by the AIDS orthodoxy. It is part and parcel of their, of their agenda, if you will. Yeah, I mean, every year at the Oscars, we have a, at least one movie that mentions AIDS. This year, we had Dallas Buyers Club mm-hmm. about people, you know, desperately going from the U.S. to Mexico to get somewhat ill-defined drugs because the only drug available back then was uh, AZT. <clears throat> but I don't want to wander too far off topic by starting to talk about AZT and AIDS in America. Um, so how do people uh, in in Somalia deal with this? Like, do, do you think that people in Somalia are better adapted to the conditions that you experienced and, and, ex- and experienced less of the illnesses that you had, or is this just a sad part of life that, that um, they're, they're not healthy on a regular basis? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the government and the entire state in Somalia, which had been created in 1960, part independence from Italy and part from Britain, and they united for the Republic of Somalia. Mm-hmm. The government and the state completely fell apart in um, January of 1991, after 31 years. And in the uh, 20, uh, you know, 23 years since then, there has been no government, there's been no state in Somalia. And so records and record-keeping of public health uh, concerns are... You know, just just a, sh- a sheer guess, frankly. Statistics gathering is 
all but non-existent in Somalia. But having been there a couple of times, last, the last time I was there was 2001, and it's a very harsh, uh, un, you know, foreboding kind of atmosphere there with guns and firearms all over the place and high levels of insecurity. But when I was there in 2001 in the north of Somalia, I did meet with some doctors, and I just, you know, we just had a casual conversation in Hargeisa, the capital of the Somaliland Republic, and I simply asked them, well, you know, what are the most common ailments that people suffer from here? And they rattled them, you know, right off in the coastal areas, some malaria, in the interior, malnutrition, protein anemia, uh, a lot of dental problems, uh, great mental instability from living in a war zone for so long. I would do it. Um, you know, t- t- tuberculosis, uh, diarrhea, that kind of thing. Um, it's a fairly conservative Muslim society. Uh, mm-hmm. There really isn't much investigation that ever goes on regarding AIDS. But if they did, if they did have a careful investigation of AIDS, using that clinical symptoms definition from Bangui in the mid-'80s that you pointed out, you know, my guess would be you'd come up with a lot of people who would meet the uh, the criteria for for an AIDS diagnosis. So, and I guess the benefit of that would be that they'd all be in line for Western aid in the form of antiretroviral drugs and condoms. And condoms, yes. And condoms, well, of course. And so, um, you know, I think. Uh, I remember when I was making a movie in Somalia for PBS in 1984, and we were in a very, very rough desert sandstorm in the uh, in the central part of Somalia, up near Galkayu. And we, we had to take a break from filming because the dust and everything was blowing so hard, it was really affecting mm. our ability to film. Right. And we took we took shelter, and there were some nomads there at the wells, and they were you know, feeding their camels. They were watering them at the wells. And through the interpreter, I, being a little bit naive here, a little childish, if you will, I asked this leading nomad through the interpreter, I said, how do you put up with this extremely difficult and harsh environment, question mark? And the nomad looked at the interpreter and he said, is this a harsh environment? (laughs) He, he he, He didn't know what I was talking about. Because this was the environment that he that he knew, and this was the environment to which he had to adjust. Um, right. I, I suspect that if you were to take that same kind of questioning and take it over to Zimbabwe or to rural areas in South Africa or into Uganda, and you ask people about these questions, particularly women, the women folk in the villages, they would look at you in amazement. They'd say, well, th- th- this is just sort of part of how we live. I think right, if you look right. at the, the the film by Brent Leung on the House of Numbers, mm-hmm. he interviews some people, um, and, and they show very graphically what, what what disposable waste facilities there are, uh, what kind of latrines and waste matter disposal facilities there are, and, and you and most people in local areas understand the connection between preparing food and preparing it in areas where you're, you're, you're doing urine, you're, you're urinating right. or defecating. Mm-hmm. They understand the connection between the two. Right. But without a lot of the facilities of the West, like running order and right. um, e- easy to boil things to cure them. But, you know, people have been there for thousands of years, maybe even longer than that, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm sure that they have many techniques to survive. I mean, I grew up in Canada, and I remember as a young kid in, like, Boy Scouts, we'd go winter camping a few times, and it was that that gave me a lot of respect for Canadian natives, because I thought, you know, I barely survived two days <laughs> in the Canadian wilderness in the winter. How did these people survive all year with nowhere to go if things didn't work out. It was like you did it or you died. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, 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 some, some always would have often come to visit me over the years, and they'd come to California, either to Los Angeles or San Francisco, and then they'd make their way up here into northern California to Chico. Now, these right. were educated, sort of world-traveling Somalis, um, but I, they were always mystified at how Californians managed to get around these roads seemingly with no map or, or no knowledge of anything. They were mystified that people didn't have crashes or go in the wrong direction. 
And I just explained, I said, you know, when you go looking for water in the north near Los Anod or Ainabo, you know what season it is and you know where you're likely to see grazing areas or some plants. When we go driving in the freeways of California, we have a general sense of where we're going. Right. And, right. and so in, in different cultures, whether it's in uh, Calgary or it's in uh, Chico or San Francisco, we have certain markers, certain things we know about, and we can ask for help. The same with the Somalis in the desert. You and I would die out there, okay? Yes. No, so many Somalis no would probably die trying to drive a car around Los Angeles. Um, yes. I was so going to say you, that you, if you shipped some of these Somalis into like downtown New York City, would, would they say, now this is a harsh environment? <laughs> they might, because they couldn't see, if they couldn't see the moon and they couldn't see the sun and they couldn't get fresh camel's milk, uh, and they looked at what passed for edible foods in New York, they, they might well say the same thing, but the best of them would adapt. They would adjust. And they yes. would, would, would know what they don't want to eat. They don't want to eat raw fish. They don't want to eat any pork products. And they'd be very careful about what they put, did put in their bodies, as we would if we were in Somalia. Right. Uh, and how much of the, the, the current problems of Somalia are related to war, the uh, disruption caused by colonialism, and you said it was Italy and Britain that have, had mm -hmm. controlled the country for some time. Yes. How, how many, how much of the problems in Somalia are, are you know, can be put on that, uh, explained on that basis? Yes. Um, um, I would just preface it by saying that the history of Somalia, I can summarize pretty quickly, the history of Uganda is a different narrative. The history mm -hmm. of the Congo is a different narrative. The history of Zimbabwe or South Africa is also a different narrative. And right. with AIDS, all of these are kind of run together. They're kind of blended together about AIDS in Africa. And it ignores the very distinct colonial and post-colonial histories of each of these countries. In the case of Somalia, you have a, a country uh, that's about the size of Texas, about 240,000 square miles, mm. up in the northeast corner of Africa. Uh, the Italians colonized the southern part of the country in the late 19th century. The British colonized the northern part. They both with, withdrew in 1960, and they formed this kind of boomerang-shaped country. The, 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 the maladies and the problems of Somalia have primarily occurred in the period after independence, not before. Okay, and so they were kind of left on their own. We're, we're going to give you independence now, and you figure out. No, not exactly. Uh, oh, oh, that it would have been that way. But instead, <laughs> in the early 60s, when Somalia became independent, it became independent like most African countries did, pretty much at the height of the Cold War. Right. And given Somalia's geopolitical location, uh, uh, you know, at the bottom of the Red Sea and across from right. South Arabia, a major shipping lane for oil tankers and so forth, mm -hmm. um, it became a kind of object of affection, first of the West until 1989, then right. of the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc right. until 1977, and then after 77 to 91, the West once again, plus the Arab League. Oh, okay, wait a minute. There's a little problem with the years here. You, you said until 99 or 69? 69, because there was a military government, a military coup in 1969 that overthrew the parliamentary regime. It became okay. a very Soviet-leaning uh, state from 1969 um, to 1977 right. when the Somalis threw the Soviets out and welcomed the West uh, back right. in. <laughs> and so throughout that whole period, despite these political somersaults, from 1960 to 1991, Somalia absolutely, for a functioning government and all of its developmental projects, depended on aid either from the West or the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund or the Arab League or the Soviet bloc uh, or the ex-colonial powers like Britain and, and Italy. And so there, there wasn't really ever built up in Somalia a productive base for the sustaining of a state, for the sustaining of a government. I, I, I written a long time ago that there was a kind of a, a drip line that went out from Western banks and Western embassies 
to a to a vein, in, and it was called Mogadishu, and right. all of the nourishment for the state of Somalia came through that drip line. And now when the Cold came War out ended, Mogadishu. in Mogadishu, the capital, when the Cold War ended in uh, 1999, uh, 19, uh, 1989, um, that drip line was kind of yanked from right. Somalia because it didn't have any more geopolitical allure. It didn't really hold any promise as far as the United States or the Soviet Union was concerned. And ironically, in late 1990, before the government fell, the American ambassador and the Soviet ambassador to Somalia both were airlifted out of, the, out of Mogadishu, sitting side by side in the same helicopter, <laughs> and taken out to an aircraft carrier off the, off the coast of Mogadishu. And soon after that, everything collapsed. And um, everything okay. was, it, it was, a, it was a, I said it was a nation that committed suicide. But certainly, well, it, we had a period of like an Islamic government, and then, of course, it went, we had the war on terror. That wasn't acceptable to the West, right? Uh, one thing to be careful of with Somalia is that most, much of the focus in terms of uh, intelligence and politics uh, from the West and even among Somalis is always focused on the, focused on the capital city of Mogadishu. Mm-hmm. Mogadishu is not Somalia. Mogadishu is a is a very very harsh, insecure, um, gun toting environment these days. It's the kind of thing that also spurred you know the pirates further up the coast right. that, that are mentioned also in the Captain Phillips film, which was you know there at the Academy Awards. Uh, I don't know how much attention uh, anyone in the film industry could tell you about the origin of those pirates and why they come from that sort of. Uh, it's an area oh about 400 miles up the coast from Ogadishu, but it's a coastal area. It's not an interior area at all. Right. But um, you know, th- these are all factors that one has to keep in mind when trying to understand the misery and the um, you know the condition of life among most Somalis. Now, what I just said about Somalia, and of course I could explain this in public health with no reference to HIV and no reference to so-called AIDS. But that narrative is going to be different for Uganda. It's yeah. going to be different for South Africa and different for Zimbabwe. But with AIDS, all of this kind of get run, gets run together. And the internal diversity of Africa is instead sacrificed for this kind of homogenous, well, they're all black people over there and they're poor and they engage in dangerous, uh, you know, dangerous sexual behavior mm-hmm. and so forth and yeah. so on. The, yeah, I mean, I think you're right is that AIDS is a single word that lumps together um, many, many complicated things so we don't have to, we don't have to think about it. I yeah. mean, it's kind of it's kind of like the whole, uh, another place I don't really want to go, but the whole global warming theory, we can turn the entire problem of human impact on the environment into how much CO2 do you produce, and we can forget about all the other uh, impacts of, of humans and just say, CO2 production is so much more uh, dangerous than anything else. We can forget about lead, arsenic, and organophorines and things like that and just focus on this one thing. And it seems the same with AIDS. Like we can forget about, um, you know, building, slowly building programs of sanitation, clean water supplies, and, uh, you know, teaching displaced uh, peoples, how to farm wherever they've ended up, and all of those things. We can just circulate condoms and antiretroviral drugs and teach them about safe sex, and then everything will be fine, except it won't be. Well, the other thing that's, that's the genius of that model is that it, it, it gives you something to keep track of, something to measure. How many condoms have been distributed? How many mm-hmm. antiretroviral drugs have been distributed under the rollout notion? And if you can measure that, that is thought to be a good. That's thought to right. be for the common good. These other questions are much trickier and more vexing to try to deal with. And I think in the 1980s, just as many of the people in the United States who had been involved in the war on cancer and the search for a viral cause for cancer, mm-hmm. when, that, when that had run out and suddenly AIDS appeared, all these people who were cancer researchers suddenly became AIDS experts. And I think with social scientists in Africa, many who had struggled long and hard, including myself, with 
these these development and underdevelopment issues and education and policy and mm. range management, sand dune stabilization, so forth and so on, were feeling, you know, kind of downcast. It looked as though by the early 80s, all of the gains of post-independence Africa from, say, 1955 to 1980 were, in fact, coming apart. And suddenly AIDS came along. And within a few years, not right away, but within a few years, uh, a lot of researchers in Africa suddenly were turning over to AIDS and becoming experts on AIDS. That's where the money was. That's where right. the research dollars flowed. It seemed to be of high urgency. Uh, dramatic movies were being made, conferences were being held, ribbons were right. being worn. You, you, you know, you better jump on the bus now because it's leaving. And right. so a lot but of them you, did. You implied earlier that it was not, uh, that in Somalia AIDS was not seen as, as big a problem of, as in some other African countries such as Uganda or South Africa, places mm-hmm. like that. Was that because the the political problems of Somalia were so blatantly obvious that it was pretty hard to explain uh, death and destruction by a virus when it was pretty obvious that it was it was uh, displacement of people, uh, you know, family members being shot by bandits, that kind of stuff. It was obvious. no, I, I don't I don't know that that was understood by by any of the AIDS researchers. I'm very unimpressed by any AIDS researcher's knowledge of the local political economies, culture, and history of the country in, in, in which they're working. I think one of the main reasons why there wasn't seen to be much AIDS in Somalia was that given the inherent insecurity and dangerousness of life in Somalia, AIDS researchers wouldn't go there. So I think if, if you go and look at the number of AIDS researchers who decamped into southwestern Uganda, into Rakai province, for example, right. Ronald Gray and that crowd, or the number of AIDS researchers who decamped into the former squalid Bantu stands, you know, the homelands in, right. in South Africa, you, you would see that many of these AIDS researchers are, are not the great heroes that make themselves out to be. Where they generally go are places in Africa which are, A, pretty secure, number mm-hmm. B, um, you know, pretty uh, comfortable to live in, and C, they're pretty much welcomed because of their money by local folks. It's almost like, it's almost as if to say, or it is to say, if you want to know where you can expect to find a lot of AIDS cases, go look for a lot of AIDS researchers, and you will find it there. Yes, there's because, probably you know huge. what you what you see depends on what you're looking for. Hey, right. That's a scientific axiom, and that's exactly what has happened in Zaire, for example. Um, and Uganda, and Zimbabwe, and South Africa. I mean, I'm just ticking these countries off. Um, so I think the the presence of AIDS researchers is usually a causal factor for finding a lot of AIDS cases. They have to. That's what they're in, in business to to research. I mean, the old development model used to be that we'd, we'd send people over from the West and they would build build a dam or they'd build a school or they dig wells or something like that. But the reality is a lot of the money that went over would go to a small elite in those countries, and a lot of development programs fell apart for a variety of reasons, and the money never really spread out. And in the case of AIDS, we're doing somewhat a similar thing. We're throwing even more money at it. But in this case, we're not, you know, there's not a possibility of coming out the other end with a with clean drinking water or a new school or anything like that. What you're going to get is, a bunch of antiretroviral drugs and a bunch of people suffering the side effects from those drugs. So even if the money is not wasted, which it often is through corruption and graft and all those other things, uh, what you're going to do is give drugs to people that cause things like anemia, which I'm sure in Somalia is already a huge problem or any other African country. Uh, yes, I, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, I used to argue in the 80s, anyhow, when I was in Somalia or in uh, in uh, Kenya, and I was in local areas, uh, and I would talk to aid officials from the United States, Agency for International Development people in the 80s, I would say, why don't you develop a program for, say, rural electrification or mm-hmm. for rural literacy 
right. or for uh, the distribution of uh, tuberculosis drugs or treatment of malaria, you know, with, with nets right. and so forth. Why, why don't you develop a doable program for a local area? Come in and explain to the local people, to the headmen, to the elders, to the leaders of the community or communities what you want to do and what your budget mm-hmm. is and what's the period of time. And if they say that that's a great idea, they want to be involved in that, then f- fund that with e- every dollar you've got. If the local people say that doesn't sound like a very good idea to us or we think we ought to do this, pay attention to what they say and go on and do something else. Whenever I would say that, I would be laughed at as just a, you know, a kind of a ivory towered uh, prof with no real understanding of what things are like on the ground in Africa. And and yet, I, most, I beg most to differ. Per- I say, I do know what's on the ground in Africa. Why don't you ask the people that know best, which right. are the people that live here, not people from Michigan or Alberta or California, but yeah. the people that live here in uh, Kisumu, you know, or or uh, in, in Yeri or any of the areas of central Kenya or Somalia, for that matter. Right. Uh, um, maybe we can turn um, to how you you got started questioning AIDS. Um, <laughs> what was it that, what, what were the things that twigged you that what everybody else is thinking might not be true? I, I, I think the first thing that, that, that got my curiosity up was the fact that I was working in the field in Somalia in 87, 88, 89, and I was doing this really obscure research on uh, the livestock trade and the live sheep trade out of Somalia to the Middle East. There's For Muslims to go to the holy city of Mecca, mm-hmm. there's a holy sacrifice that's made. It's called the Korbani sacrifice, and, and sheep have to be slaughtered in the particular style, like a kosher way, the halal style. And it's a ceremonial thing, but the meat is given to poor people uh, anywhere in the area um, to to, to eat, and the pilgrims themselves eat that. And so I was doing this comparison between Somali exports of live sheep, small but very, very robust sheep that would be exported from northern Somalia to, uh, to Mecca and to Medina and to Jeddah up the Red Sea, versus the exports of live sheep from uh, Australia, from Western Australia, all the way across the Indian Ocean and so forth. And I was having the most difficult time getting reliable numbers. I mean, I was doing economic history, so I needed to have reasonable statistics. Right. And they were very hard to get, you know, in the bush, in the rural areas. I come down to Mogadishu, and the World Bank people, they had all these numbers. And I said, where'd you get these? You know, how, did, how did you know these numbers? And, of course, they'd kind of, you know, clock and shuffle their feet a little bit. And they were just totally made up. They really were. They were just extrapolations based on, rooted on nothing. Right. So right. when I got to thinking about this in the late 80s and I started to ask myself about AIDS, I was startled and amazed and very impressed by the number of cases of AIDS that were known to be in Uganda, or the number of cases of HIV infection in Zaire. And right. I said, I wonder, where do they get these numbers from? How are they so reliable? And yes, in I think James... do not have a reliable statistical organization. Right. I, I've heard that pretty much only South Africa has reliable statistics. Yes, yes. The, um, uh, th- there was an outfit out of uh, Harvard that uh, it's called the um, the global burden of disease, right. and uh, sub-Saharan Africa is uh, got the lowest statistical basis for the causes of death for mortality. Uh, they're really only sure, says the centers. I mean, the uh, the global burden of disease center at Harvard. They they say pretty standardly that all of Africa, in all of Africa. Uh, they probably can only be sure of the cause of death for maybe 2 or 3% of the people. That's the lowest of any region in the world. But of that 2 or 3%, surely 70% of those numbers come from South Africa, which does have a very reliable statistical base. And, and so I, I think my first concern and curiosity was over these numbers from nowhere. Um, wh- where do they come from? 
And the more I scratched and the more I dug, and that's continued for 25 years, I have just been amazed at the lack of curiosity, the lack of criticism on the part of the media or on the part of other AIDS uh, scientists into these rather elementary questions. It also applies to the United States. I mean, for example, just yeah. if I can, mm-hmm. March, March 28th is, is called uh, sort of like uh, uh, Native Americans and Indians HIV AIDS Awareness Day. I didn't know that. Yes, coming up on March. <laughs> it's March probably in the March of twenty eighth of the year. Okay. Um, well, um, I think I have the numbers uh, somewhere here. I was kind of curious as to how many. Um, let's see. I, I was curious as to how many uh, a, a, um, Native Americans there are right. in in some of the key uh, years, and. Um, I think I've got it here somewhere. Uh, the number of uh, here it is. Okay, between the age of 25 and 34, the Indian population, according to the 2010 surf, uh, census in the United States, 650,000. Mm-hmm. That's the total Indian population of the United States, 25 to 34, the most um, vulnerable age cohort for HIV or for AIDS. Mm -hmm. For um, 2010, which is the last year we have good data from the CDC, which came out in December of 2013, the total number of Native Americans who died of all causes in that age cohort of of 650,000, the total number of deaths from all causes is 795. That's the total cause, all causes, most of them involving accidents, uh, suicide right. and murder. The right. total number of people out of 650,000 in the Native American community who died of HIV is number seven on the leading cause of death. But the total number who died of HIV in 2010, yeah. nine, nine, nine. So, you know, I would wonder, now, given that fact, given that number, um, why are we having a special day for this? What, what's the awareness? That seems to be pretty aware, as far as I can tell. But nine is much bigger than one. Nine is nine hundred times better than you know than one. So right, and if it goes up to ten the following year, then then that'll be a ten percent increase. And in in pre- in, in, uh, there's been a ten percent jump in the number of deaths right. from HIV in the Native American communities. Yeah, they, and, they were trick in Canada with their statistics is they express AIDS cases as a percentage. And and this right. helps you to avoid attention to the fact that the number of cases goes down every year. And I, I think in Canada, the number of deaths is under 100 a year in the total population of the country. Um, but the nice thing about percentages is that in order to make it 100%, one portion has to go up if another goes down. So what we have you know, in Canada, for example, from between 2005 and 2010, we have Aboriginals making up 25% of the uh, HIV diagnoses in 2005 and 35% in 2010, but the actual number of cases amongst Aboriginals has gone down. But we can write that the epidemic is increasingly become becoming an epidemic of Aboriginals, because they now make up 35% of the cases, and nobody will do the math to figure out, okay, well, that's actually fewer than before, so we should be happy that it's going down in every group. It's just not as fast in Aboriginal. Well, I think you also, I mean, because it was statistics that got me first interested in all of this, and particularly the the absence of good, reliable data Mm. in Africa. If you also look at really sound statistical bases, such as the state of California, or better, the San Francisco Department of Public Health, there there are remarkable statistics, which, you know, you have to put on a little green visor and you have to do some elbow grease here to find these out because they don't make it easy to find this out. But I've been following for the last 20 years what's been called the HIV AIDS quarterly surveillance report that comes out of the San Francisco Department of Public Health. And there, as of late 2011, you could find a table that listed adult, adolescent HIV AIDS cases over the age of 12 by transmission category, 1980 to 2011. So that's 31 years of keeping Mm -hmm. track 
of AIDS in one of the areas where some have said AIDS was born in Los Angeles or San right. Francisco. Okay, you go look here, and you look at the total number of heterosexual contact females. How mm-hmm. many heterosexual contact females are said to have AIDS or HIV AIDS over 31 years? And that number is right. 321. That's official. I'm, I'm a finger on the number here. 321. That's roughly about 10 a year. Right. In a city where 90% of the people are heterosexuals, and many right. of the women in San Francisco certainly are upscale and lead a party-style life. There's no doubt right. about that. But 321. How about heterosexual contact males? Heterosexual contact males over 31 years in San Francisco – 161. Wow. Now, bear in mind that there's a little number next to each one of those categories, a number two, and watch how this enables them to expand the category. Number two says the 321 women, 161 men over 31 years, but includes persons who have had heterosexual contact with a person with HIV AIDS or with a person who is at risk for HIV. So there's guilt by association that even increases that number even, you know, even further. So, but it's still not very big. It's not very big. And so what's happened is, though I just got the latest AIDS report from San Francisco, and they've changed, they've changed the basis for accounting. It's no longer a quarterly report. It's now a semi-annual report. It's an HIV semi-annual surveillance report as right. of well, 12-31-2013. And I go and look at this, and the data from before 2002, to give you some sense of a prospectus, is gone. It just starts in 2002, and it begins from there. And so I look at the total number of HIV infection stage 3 and year of AIDS diagnosis in San Francisco, for last year, 153, which is about, I'd say, 50%, 55% down from 2012. Right. So even with statistics like You don't like read in, articles saying, you know, this, there's dramatic decreases. That just never happens. Like in, in Canada, while we're swapping statistics, the peak – was in 1993 where there were 1,827, 1,827 AIDS cases in the mm-hmm. entire country of about somewhat over 30 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, eight, 1,827 AIDS mm-hmm. cases, and that was down in 2010 to 188 cases over the entire year, and yet it's still referred to as an epidemic in Canada. Oh, the population is mm-hmm. even bigger, so it's actually even more um, dramatic. Let's see. Um, with, uh, with 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 California, you have to really dig for this because it's it's cumulative numbers. Okay, so they always have big numbers. It's hard to see the actual number of HIV or AIDS numbers for California without going to yet another uh, another tablet, another another piece of statistics. But the, the whole point is that th- this is one of the key areas where I think the critics of, you know, the age orthodoxy have, in in fact, made some headways. I I know that Nancy Padian and her allies and supporters are always furious and enraged at the way that critics of the age orthodoxy have used her studies to show how minimal the risk is, again, for any kind of transmission based on heterosexual contacts. It's not our research, it's her research. Right. Um, I mean, so, Nancy Paddy in her 1997 mm-hmm. paper yes. said we followed 175 HIV discordant couples over time. That's one HIV positive, one HIV negative, for a total of approximately 282 couple years. We observed no zero conversions after entry into the study. Mm-hmm. So they they basically found that that HIV was not sexually transmitted, but they then made up some numbers. And in the abstract of that paper, of course, they didn't report the fact that they'd found no 
sexual transmission, but they included the made-up numbers, which is about one out of a thousand for men and one out of ten thousand for women. Well, well I, I, Nancy Padian was in San Francisco at the national meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, in uh, February of '09, I think it was, and I was mm-hmm. in the audience, and uh, she made her typical presentation, and. Uh, okay. They would never. Re- I raised my hand, but they never recognized me. But I did have her <laughs> I'm sure email address. I, I went up to her and I got her email address from her, right. and I, you know, I sent her a, a, an email with a copy to somebody else in the AAAS, and I said how how, how, how interesting and how stimulating it was to hear her presentation, and uh, it ex- helped explain a lot of things in my mind. And I was most grateful for her hard work in this behalf. But I said, I wonder if she could help me with a statistic that I, I was having trouble understanding. And I cited the statistics with the table and the page from the quarterly surveillance report that would have been uh, from back around 19, uh, 2008, where I, where I had those numbers about heterosexual contact males and heterosexual contact females. And I wondered if she could just kind of sort of help me out with what, what, what seemed in her mind to be the most plausible suggestions for those rather low numbers. Yes, yes. Never, never got a response. And so I waited about a month, emailed her back again, copies to more people. And I said, I know you're very busy traveling and so forth, um, doing research. Maybe this email went astray. Uh, so I could, I could I raise it again with you? And I'm just kind of wondering how I'm working on a book on AIDS. And I, I don't understand what, how these numbers can be so low. So, so what you're saying is if, if HIV is sexually transmitted, mm. and uh, given that we know there's a lot of bisexual men around, and in, in San Francisco, which has a very large gay population, there's going to be a lot of sexual mixing between the homosexual and a heterosexual population, that there should be a lot more heterosexual cases. But they're not there. Now, now, (laughs) let me give you another little example. Uh, I teach at Cal State University in Chico. Mm -hmm. For a long time, it's had this undeserved reputation of being a great party school. And a lot of people believe it. In in its January 1987 issue, Playboy, a very important scientific journal, yeah, rated CSU Chico the- as the number one party school in America. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, about 2005, 2005 or 2006, I went over to the Student Health Center, and I met with a doctor there who was concerned about sexually transmitted diseases, which they right. were, mm-hmm. and. I wanted to know, when did they start giving HIV tests? And they said 1989. And I mm-hmm. said, how many do you roughly give a year? And she said, mm, about 1,000. I said, okay. okay, so that would work out to about 16,000 HIV tests on a okay. population that is known to be very sexually active because of the number of cases of genital warts, warts right. and of herpes simplex. Right. And so, but there's no no gonorrhea, no syphilis. It's a it's a fairly well-to-do middle upper middle class, largely sure. white student body that parties like hell drinks and mm-hmm. you know screws around a lot. Right. I said of the 16,000 HIV tests given on this admittedly sexually active population, how many came back positive? And she looked at me and she said one. I said, <laughs> one. And, which is, is an low. easy number to remember. <laughs> One, I because said, I thought, that the, you know, from what I've seen, the, that if you took a thousand low-risk people, you'd probably get one positive HIV test. Well, so that's extraordinarily low. And I said, well, given all of the obvious sexual activity that takes place here, evidently without protection, given the general warts numbers and the herpes simplex that you see, um, can you tell me what was the one case, male or female? She didn't know. I said, was it, a, was it an IV or a psychoactive drug user? Didn't know that either. I said, was, it, was the person straight or gay? Didn't know that either. You and think they remember something I like looked that. Her, I looked her right in the eye, and I said, well, given what we know about HIV and, you know, how unprotected sex is what contributes to its spread, how, how do you explain this extraordinarily low number. I mean, a heartbeat away from zero. How do you explain this low number at the health center in Chico over 
16 years. David, she looked at me and she mm-hmm. said, you know, I really don't know. I don't have an explanation. And so at that point, a person like me has two choices. I can say, have you ever thought about blah, 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 blah. Right. Or you thank her and you get up and walk away. So I thanked <laughs> right. her and I, went, and I left. because that was the right decision because sure. if, if she had been interested in critical thinking, she had a lot of time to sit back and think about that. And you'd think if she thought about it, she would have gone into the records and said, well, was this a gay man? Was this an African? Like, she would have at least had the prejudices of which risk group does it come from? Was it an ID drug user? You'd, you'd think that, that they would have, uh, you know, looked into, into at least followed their prejudices about who it might be. But to actually have no knowledge means that they just did the test, got the results, and cared nothing about what it actually meant. Um, and I, I think I also had it at my fingertips, and I don't have it now, but there was this, uh, she passed away recently, she's 75, Gloria Leonard, who was a great pornography star and a pornography um, businesswoman. Right. Who died at 74 of old age. But... Back in 2005, Gloria Leonard was involved with giving HIV tests to the male and female porn stars. You know, right. that's based in L.A. Um, and I think, and I could dig this up if I had to, between about 1985 and 2005, they administered about 85,000 HIV tests to mm-hmm. male and female porn stars. And of the 85,000... Nine, nine had come back positive. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I had in my mind that the, the HIV infection rate among the students at Chico State tracked fairly closely to arguably the cohort that has the most sex of any group in the country, which are porn stars. Right. And the number was very low, and I bet that uh, you know you could submit that nine number if you had their medical charts to your kind of critical thinking, and you'd find out that it was something else, probably drug consumption or yeah. things of that sort that would have explained that, anyhow, that low rate of infectivity, which is microscopic. Yeah, and yet if you went to a campus that was mostly black people, even if they were mostly middle class and fairly well off, you'd probably find a much higher rate, at least according to the research of Dr. Henry Bauer, who's right, found right. that it's kind of genetic predisposition to testing positive on the HIV test, which, mm. as Henry Bauer has said, that either means that blacks are very, very promiscuous or there's something wrong with the AIDS theory. And given that every measure of, of sexual activity amongst blacks shows that they are similar to whites or, or more conservative. More, definitely more conservative, <laughs> yes. Yes, I mean, certain uh, populations, like in Somalia, how, uh, you know, w- what was, you know, what did you observe about the sexual practices, like people were married, um, I mean, wh- what happened in Somalia if you had an affair? Very, very dangerous, because in Somalia to this day, uh, the practice of female you know, circumcision, female genital mutilation is still widely practiced. And so almost all the little girls undergo this um, removal of their clitoris and the stitching back of their vagina so that they are guaranteed to be virginal for their husband. And that makes sexual activity extremely painful and very difficult for Somali uh, women. For For that reason... Many Somali men, while they'll be married to a Somali woman, will in fact take a girlfriend or um, you know some kind of a lover on the side who is not Somali, who's right. maybe maybe European. Uh, and again, this isn't something that would go on in Somalia because the white population of Somalia is so small. Right. It would in fact generally take place if they were traveling abroad, which means. There's a social class element involved in this, and nomads. Uh, right. Everybody knows everybody's business in these small nomadic hamlets. The same right. thing in Zululand. Um, everybody knows everybody's business. You don't go wandering from hut to hut when you're way home and, and having sex with this woman or that woman. That'll get you killed in no time in Zululand and right. Africa. Right. Some aggrieved 
husband or something. Mm, or sure. Who you in, so. Everybody will know about it, too. There's no, it's no you know, a Marriott hotel that you can squire away to under the cover of darkness. Yeah. These are rural areas where everybody knows everybody else's business. And yeah. that in and of itself creates a very conservative rural sexual climate, if you will. Right, which which is definitely not what the West thinks of when they think of Africa. There's a lot of holier-than-thou uh, talk about that, but then you only have to go to the grocery store to the checkout counter and see these trashy magazines that are right. obsessed with the sex lives of the rich and famous. Mm-hmm. To and and look at advertising and all those other things where you see, you know, a much higher level of sexual freedom in the West, and yet somehow that means that Africans have more sex than white people in the West have. I don't understand. Well, I'm, I'm so still I'm understand. still looking for a good, clear explanation from the CDC about why we need to have this HIV AIDS Awareness Day for Native Americans. I. I mean, are they aware of how small the number is? Well, they probably are, um, but maybe they can go up to Canada and learn this trick with percentages. And given that, um, you know, the whole number of AIDS cases is declining everywhere, maybe one year they'll have an increase from 9 to 10 in Aboriginal AIDS cases, and they can, um, you know, maybe combined with... um, the decline in other areas, they can say that Aboriginal cases have risen from a sh- from eight percent to a shocking twelve percent of all AIDS cases in America, and we have to do something about the epidemic. When you actually look at the statistics, maybe it's gone from nine to ten. Mm-hmm. There are many uh, tricks that they know. And when I've tried to, I years ago tried to write to the CDC to get information that I knew that they had. I was working with a Ukrainian statistician to uh, we saw the reports and we we knew that they had this data and we wanted um, to get some of their raw data without any you know identif- individual identifiers which is their first excuse mm-hmm. would reveal people's names and they wouldn't give it to us so I, mm-hmm. I think your instincts about statistics are right I, I think I hear the music telling us that we've come to the end of the hour I'd just like to thank you very much for sharing your knowledge about uh, Somalia and AIDS and how those two things interact. And um, I'm, I'm sure people will learn a lot from what you've talked about today. Good. It's been a pleasure being here with you, David. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Charles. All right. It's been a great Bye-bye. pleasure. Goodbye.